Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I am Cristina Perez Jimenez. I'm a proud member of ALBA's Board of Governors. And on behalf of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, I want to thank you all so much for being with us today. ALBA's mission is to preserve the legacy of the volunteers who fought fascism in Spain. If you are joining our events for the first time, be sure to check out our website for more information. And I think you should be able to find the links to our website in the chat. Um, also be sure to sign up to receive our quarterly publication, The Volunteer, it's fantastic. Um, ALBA is pleased to offer our programs free of charge, but of course, this is only possible through the generosity of our donors. Please do consider making a donation at the links, which you can also find in the chat. There's no donation too small or too big. We really, really thank you for your generosity and for your support. And a couple of housekeeping matters. This event will be recorded. If you prefer not to be seen, you may turn off your camera. We will also be taking questions. There will be opportunity for questions from the audience. So start thinking about your questions now. We will soon invite you to put them in the chat. The film you're about to see is a powerful documentary about the genocidal military campaigns against Guatemala's indigenous populations under the leadership of Efrain Rios Montt and a cinematic cry against impunity. The film demonstrates the lasting impacts of these crimes and how their effects extend well beyond the borders of the country. Issues of war, atrocities, and impunity are not confined to a single time and place. And as, our, and as authoritarian regimes continue to violently oppress and suppress people across the globe, I think this film is a timely reminder, a really urgent reminder, that the fight against justice and human rights is an ongoing struggle. And this is a truth that is so central to our mission here at ALBA. And with that, I would like to introduce my fellow board member, ALBA board chair, Sebastian Faber. Sebastian has been involved with ALBA since he won the George Watt Prize in 2000. He teaches at Oberlin College and writes for the US and Spanish media. His most recent book, Leyendas Negras, Marcas Blancas, came out in November. The second expanded edition of his book, Exhuming Franco, Spain's Second Transition, will be out in the fall. For ALBA, he also co-edits a quarterly magazine, The Volunteer and helps direct teachers' workshops. So I wanna thank you so much, all of you for being here and over to you, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Christina, for the beautiful introduction. Um, it's great to see all of you once again on one of our online events. Uh, I love doing these things because they're always interesting and I don't have to travel for them. And that's nice. I'm here in Ohio where it's a really cold day. Um, thanks for joining us all. Um, we're going to shoot to try to wrap up a little bit after the five o'clock hour. And I think we'll at the most go till 5.15 or so, just so you know. Um, I will introduce our guests in a second. Um, I'll spend about um, 20 minutes or so asking them some, some questions and engaging them. And then we'll open it up to the audience. As usual, um, our executive assistant, Dennis Meany, has been kind enough, will be kind enough to triage your questions that you can pose at any point of the event. You can pose them in the chat uh, box on Zoom. And um, he will um, select questions um, and then offer you the opportunity to ask your question yourself if he you selects your question. If you prefer not to appear with voice or image on this recorded event, um, that's absolutely fine. Dennis can also ask your question for you. So he'll, he'll leave you that option. If you prefer, as Christine said, if you prefer not to appear with the image in this uh, recorded event, feel free to turn your camera off just to listen in. Um, um, as Christina said, we are a nonprofit, uh, 501c3. Any generous donation you are willing or able to make, um, if you find this event inspiring, is fully tax deductible, um, just so you know. And um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce um, our guests. I'm really thrilled to have Pamela Yates and Paco Denise with us today. Um, 
I, I've, I've known Pam and Paco for, for a while. They've come to Ohio a couple of times to screen their movies. I think that the work that they do with their production company is, is unparalleled in the U.S. and maybe the world in terms of their the creativity and, and the um, integrity with which they produce media about important human rights issues. And, and I want to ask them about that in a second. I'll go ahead now and introduce them. Um, Pamela Yates and Paco Nice are co-founders of Skylight Pictures, a Brooklyn-based nonprofit company dedicated to creating feature-length documentary films and digital media tools that advance awareness of human rights and the quest for justice by implementing multi-year outreach campaigns designed to engage, educate, and activate social change. Skylight seeks to strengthen social justice movements through cinematic storytelling and catalyze collaborative networks of artists and activists. Pamela Yates has directed more than a dozen films. Among them are the Sundance Special Jury Award winning When the Mountains Tremble, uh, which is of course the, the referenced in the Granito, the movie that you saw, and State of Fear about Peru, which has been translated into 47 languages and broadcast in 154 countries. Pamela was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for the film Granito. Her third film in the Guatemalan um, quartet, uh, 500 Years, entitled 500 Years, has had its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival as well. She was executive producer of the Academy Award-winning documentary, Witness to War. And she is now finishing the fourth film in the Guatemalan quartet, the tetralogy on Guatemala called Borderland, which will be finished later this year and out in 2024. Paco Renis, a member of the ABBA board, as I said, is the ED and executive producer of Skylight. He's the co-creator of Solidary Labs, a program designed to disseminate Skylight's innovative model for creating human rights media ecosystems in conjunction with committed media makers, artists, technologists, and movement organizations with the aim of building enduring networks for, of 21st century human rights defenders. We'll talk, I'll ask him about that in a second as well. Uh, Paco's film credits, many film credits um, in term, as a producer include 500 Years, Granito, Rebel Citizen, Disruption, State of Fear, um, The Reckoning about the International Criminal Court, and Borderland, this uh, film that's currently in its um, final stages which deals with the huge question of immigration justice in the United States. Welcome, Pam and Paco. It's great to have you here. Um, the first thing I wanna ask you about is, um, since we all saw Granito, um, can you tell us a little bit about what the third and fourth installments of the Guatemalan Quartet deal with and what in, in, in what way they tell us what happened perhaps before this very suspenseful and 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 beautiful story you tell in Granito, and what happened since um, then? What what happened after Granito ends? Um, I think everybody is curious to sort of hear both the prequel and the sequel. If you can tell us. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Christina and Mark and Dennis. And hello to everyone who's joined in. Um, Paco and I have been longtime supporters of Alba and um, big believers in the power of archive, as you can see in Granito. Um, but, you know, we made When the Mountains Tremble in 1982. I actually went to Guatemala to research the role that the United States had played in overthrowing the democratically elected government of Jacobo Arbenz in 1954, and in ushering in a legacy of brutal military dictatorships. And, and the protagonist in that film is Rigoberta Menchú Tum, um, who later became a Nobel Peace Laureate. But Rigobert and I traveled all over the world with that film and actually premiered at Sundance. It won a special jury award at Sundance as well. But we weren't able to show the film in Guatemala. We could not show the film publicly in Guatemala. And I vowed to go to Guatemala when there was the first public screening that could be organized. And I went to Guatemala 20 years after When the Mountains Tremble was made. That was the first public screening. It was at the University of San Carlos. It was standing room only. We got there, we showed the film, it was an amazing evening. And afterwards, two of the attorneys 
who were working on a case came up to me and said, did you keep all of the outtakes from When the Mountains Tremble? Because we're working on a genocide case and two of the generals are in your original footage. And we, you know, we had kept all of the archives. It was in a warehouse in New Jersey and we hadn't touched them in a quarter of a century. And we went back into the archives and what we found surprised even us, because um, as you know, from having seen Granito, we found inculpatory evidence of um, the intention of genocide, which is a very hard crime to prove against General Efraim Briasmont. This was material that we hadn't uh, included in our original film. And so we brought all of that film, it was in 16 millimeter, and quarter inch uh, audio tape. We brought it all into the digital realm and the attorneys were able to take it and um, use it in building the case. But Granito is really about um, all of di these different people efforts, as you know, to contribute their granito de arena to uh, positive social change, contribute their granito de arena to, to building the case. And the case was built and the film was made and the film was shown widely uh, around um, the United States and Latin America and in Guatemala. And I think the film itself is a granito de arena to um, bring the case from the Spanish National Court, which where it was being tried under the um, principle of universal jurisdiction to Guatemala. It helped embolden justices and jurists and judges to bring the case. Because it's always better to try the cases in the places where the alleged crimes took place. And so um, when that happened and the trial was set to begin in 2013, um, we knew we had to film it. And we knew we had to document it. We didn't know what or how or where, if the trial was even gonna continue or come to an end, but we just, we knew we had to film it. We didn't have any money. We got a volunteer crew from, from Colombia, the United States and Guatemala, we all converged on the courtroom. And funnily enough, this is the 10th anniversary, like 10 years ago today, this trial was going on. This trial, which was the first trial for genocide against indigenous people in the Americas ever. And we know that there have been a lot of um, genocides against indigenous people. So this small country in Latin America had this first trial, which was a model for all of Latin America, it was a model for the United States, and indeed it was a model for the for the world. It was an incredibly well-built case, pushed ahead and never abandoned by the survivors of the genocide themselves. And that was that became the film 500 Years. So that is the, so, so Granito being the middle film is looking both backwards and forwards. And in some ways telling the same story, but from different historical vantage points and with different protagonists as as is want as as history is want to do. Hmm. Right, would you want to say something too? Or, or... I, I I I don't have anything to add to that. That's okay. great. <laughs> That's wonderful. So um the 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 coverage of the Rios Mont trial was was massive um in the media as I, if I can remember 10 years ago. Um but the trial itself had 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 a had a strange uh ending in the sense that um if i remember correctly rios mont was finally um the case finally kind of after the conviction was uh, appealed and then um didn't go forward based on on uh if i remember a, a formality of some sort and and generally i think uh the historical memory of the case in public consciousness to the extent that people are aware of it is, is as an anti-climax, right? It's like, it, we seem to have made it and then we didn't. Um, I'm curious if you share that reading of that, uh, of the outcome of that trial. Uh, I would say not only do I not share that reading, and I know that Pamela doesn't either, but the Mayan people don't share that reading. So the Mayan people, they, they have this, they even, you know, have, they, it's a saying that they have now, that this, you know, la sentencia, uh, you know, the sentence holds. And the fact is, Rios Montt died under house arrest. The trial, it didn't end, you know, it was put into a kind of hiatus with these sort of mechanisms of impunity. But nevertheless, in our view, and I think the view of, of almost every Mayan, 
he died a genocidaire, a convicted genocidaire. Uh, he was never unconvicted, right? I mean, the, the, the trial was put in hiatus, as, as I say. So it's not like there was a decision that said he was innocent. That never happened. And so uh, unfortunately, I think the narrative that, you know, that came out in the media around the world is, oh, the trial was a failure. And, you know, for the many people in Guatemala, for a huge amount of the Mayan population, it was not a failure. Uh, so it really depends on how you look at it. Um, I also so. think that the quest for justice is justice. I mean, I think in many ways, that's what the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive is all about. I mean, keeping an archive means that you're you continually to tell you're continuing to tell the story and seeking justice you know seeking justice for the crimes that that were not able to be talked about or were not able to be tried so uh just the fact that before the trial um people believed that genocide didn't happen in guatemala now that's no longer on the table genocide happened in guatemala and the the trial told the story the trial was had to be done over again for procedural reasons, never for evidentiary reasons. And in the Supreme Court of Guatemala, the vote was three to two. So there were two dissenting justices and three who voted to overturn it. The, uh, the pressure from the business and political elite in Guatemala, who feared that they would be the next to be put on trial, was enormous. So they couldn't stop it. It was going to be tried again, but Rios Montt died. In most people's minds in Guatemala, he's a convicted genocidaire. It's, it's, it's super interesting the um, what, what you say about uh, uh, sort of the 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 the, the interpretation of, of what happened among the people most affected. Right, it makes me think of of the two things that your your filmmaking contributes: which is images and stories. Right, you tell images, you tell stories through images, and how do you see the relationship between your image-based storytelling and the kind of thing that happens in an actual trial, which is also storytelling based on evidence, which are often images or documents. Do you see your own work as a kind of trial work, or do you see it pretty separate from what happens in the courtroom, which is bound by all kinds of, as you say, procedural and complicated um, uh, details often? Well, there's a beautiful relationship between documentary filmmaking and um, or documentary filmmakers and lawyers. In a lot of ways, we do the same things, right? We try to tell the story based on the best possible evidence that we have, the good facts that speak to um, our position, right? And then we present that to, in the case of lawyers, to a jury, or we present that in the case of a filmmaker to the general public. And I believe whoever tells the story, the best story um, based on the facts wins the day. So in our films, because um, this isn't the first film about you know, uh, the quest for justice or a jury trial, uh, we've made many about that. Um, we really try to integrate the inside and the outside of the courtroom and try to do it in a seamless way that takes people through the trial. Because actually trials, you know, they're interesting, but there's a lot of really boring parts in them too. And in <laughs> documentary filmmaking, you wanna keep the public engaged as much as possible. You really wanna take people on the same kind of emotional journey that you as a filmmaker went on when you were covering the trial and, and, and telling the story. And luckily film has a lot of super powerful elements to be able at, at our disposal to be able to do that like cinematography and music and, um, the close-ups of people's faces. And um, and I believe that that's how, you know, the two come together. And maybe even why we gravitate to telling the kinds of stories that often inv involve trials and legal systems, legal responses. Paco, you mentioned um, archives earlier. Um, from Granito, the, 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 um, the, the, the sheer potential of archives is super clear, right? Both your own archive, like don't throw things away. Your outtakes might be useful someday. And right. your archives and, and the U.S. archives that Kate Doyle through the National Security Archives can access and, and use as proof. Um, but then, of course, your own finished film becomes itself part of a different type of archive, 
as you make the film, and I should also um, mention here Peter Kernoy, who's, who's your editor, um, as, as you guys compose your film, how aware are you that you're doing it for the ages in a way, also to become part of an archive? Well, I would say that we're we're aware in a sense that like when a an author writes a book, he's writing it for the ages, let's say, you know, making a documentary film, especially the way we do it, which is sort of the, what we call slow cooking documentary making. Uh, it's like writing a, a, a book, really. You know, it's like writing a nonfiction novel. Uh, or, sorry, this not, there's no such thing as a nonfiction novel, but a nonfiction story. And uh, we, uh, we've become more and more aware over the years of how important it is to, uh, you know, to archive what we have. Like, for example, the, the evidence in the Rios Mount trial that was used from skylight footage, that footage was not in When the Mountains Tremble. That because at the time when When the Mountains Tremble was made, the idea of generals being put on trial, you know, Argentina hadn't happened yet. I mean, it's like, uh, it, no, actually it had, but you know, this, it, wasn't, it wasn't a factor that we were thinking about. And so the, that, that, conf that confession, but that statement by Rios Montt about, you know, if I'm not in charge of the army, then who is? You know, that was a very inculpatory statement. Uh, it didn't make it into the film. It wasn't part of the narrative that we were working on in When the Mountains Tremble. So having kept all that, that was so important. We realized, wow, you know. And it's interesting because a program of ours that you mentioned, Solidara Labs, that came about when we were invited with Granito in, nine, in 2014. We were invited to Bogota in Colombia to uh, a conference called Archives for Peace where they gathered together representatives of you know, people who were studying archives that had been uncovered, like the police archives in Guatemala, the Stasi archives in East Germany, the archives in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Colombia itself. And so uh, Granita was shown as a film that related to this idea of the archives. And of course, the police archives are featured in Granito. Uh, after that, we were surrounded by you know, dozens of Colombian activists that had come to the conference uh, from all these remote regions of Colombia that were out there, you know, defending their communities against extractive industries, against all kinds of threats. And uh, they asked us, you know, how we need our story to be told as well. You know, where, you know, where, how can that happen? And why don't you come to our communities and tell these stories? And of course, we couldn't go to all these places and make all these films. And we asked them, well, why don't you talk to Colombian filmmakers? There's a lot of talent in Colombia. Um, they said, we don't know how to find filmmakers, talk to filmmakers. Where do you start? And so that's where we decided to create a laboratory space, a, a week of uh, sort of a relational rather than transactional space where filmmakers, through an open call, filmmakers and activists from the country, the first one was in Colombia, could come together and get to know each other, learn what each other does and build trust and solidarity. And out of that would come different projects. And that's what's happened. And we've done four Solidarity Labs so far, uh, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, another one in Colombia that was focused on Afro-Colombian communities. And the next one's gonna be in Peru. That's, that's amazing. You, you said something that jumped out to me. You said relational, not transactional. Um, and um, my students here at Oberlin, are very politically sensitive and they're often quick to accuse any media maker of exploiting their subjects. Mm -hmm. um, from what I remember, when you guys visited to screen Granito here, you explained how carefully you think about the way in which everybody who participates in your projects gets back from the project or is given back. And, and I remember. I think that when you guys make Granito, your first screening was in Guatemala, not in the United States, for example. And and can you talk a little bit about how how you think about documentary production and the communities that you work with, how you involve them, and 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 also in the aftermath of post of, of once the movie is finished, how that how that operates. Yeah, sure. Well, our model is is collaborative and not extractivist because it's not just extractivist industry. I mean, any mode of operation can be extractivist. You can be an extractivist academic, for example. 
So how do we go and work collaboratively with communities to tell stories and not extract the story and uh, take the story out from the place and, and make a film about it and then travel around the world to film festivals, you know, for our own enhancement, our own career enhancement. And, and actually the person who was really instrumental in helping at least me understand that from a very, from our very first film was Rigoberto Menchu. I think because in the Mayan communities, the, the way of being is very uh, collaborative. It's very collective. And so um, when we took the film out into the world um, and when we were actually making the film in the studio, her ideas and input um, made the film so much richer than it would have been if it had just been like one director, me, um, making, making the film. And so really from that, I began to understand, or we began to understand that, that um, to involve people in the telling of their own stories to not only in the making of the stories, but in the editing of the stories. And then when the film is finished in taking the stories out into the world. And in some cases, people in our films, um, like on Andrea Ischiu, who is a protagonist in 500 years, a young protagonist in 500 years, uh, is now making her first feature length documentary film. You know, they, they, they become, become so much a part of the process that they figure like, I can do this too. You know, the whole mystique of filmmaking is, is taken out of the equation and um, you see how it can be, uh, a, a, there can be a different way of operating in the world, um, a, a way that is 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 not for profit, but is for social dividends, and and that's the model we try to share in Solidarity Labs. Like, how do we create a virtuous cycle between the filmmakers and the movements? How can the how can the filmmakers help the movements build, and how can the movements help take the films out into the world? Um, and that's you know that's how we design our outreach and impact campaigns for all our films and what we hope to achieve with all the films. That's that's really um, beautifully, and I love the way it's so thought through um, in, in an ethical way. Um, maybe my final question for now has to do with, with the audience reach. Um, you tell stories, you, in a way you mediate between the communities that you work with and, and, and the general public in the United States and Latin America. Um, the stories you tell are also um, so impactful that that um, those in power can feel um, can feel um, the message come to them as well, right? To to shape the way that they make policy or votes or 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 whatever. Your newest film that that I can't wait to see it will be out next year, Borderland, um, deals as far as I understand with 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 immigration from Latin America with the, with the complicated with the complicated situation and the often appalling situation that this country puts people in who seek asylum, for example, at the border. Um, the, the, to me, one of one of sort of the, the founding fathers of, of political documentary making is, is, is the Dutch filmmaker Joris Evans, who in 1937 made The Spanish Earth, this famous documentary with Ernest Hemingway and John Das Passas about the Spanish Civil War. And Evans had the privilege of screening the documentary before it was released in the U.S. in the White House screening room for uh, Franklin Roosevelt and, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And I was curious if, if you could screen Borderland um, in the White House screening room for, for, for Joe Biden, um, how would that be? And would, would, you let, would you find that interesting to do? Or do you feel that the real power of your documentaries is the general public that then applies pressure on politicians? Um, or do you see a, a way that your documentary can directly appeal or, or shape the, the thinking of those who make, in the end, important decisions? Well, uh, you know, while it would be nice to have the opportunity to show Borderland to Biden and, and Kamala Harris and, and their staff, uh, I, I really believe that change comes from the bottom up. And so, you know, Borderland is really uh, a lot primarily about immigrants organizing themselves to seek their rights and justice. It's, you know, kind of like a civil rights movement for immigrants, uh, which is, you know, sort of percolating uh, invisibly in many ways 
in this country and we call the film border land rather than lands you know it's in singular because as many immigrants have told us if, if you're undocumented the border is always within you it's wherever you are right. you know you could be in the middle of kansas and the cop stops you you don't have your papers on you or whatever it is and you get deported so the border is where where you are uh, it's inside so that having to live that way is is really outrageous and you know the, the immigration reform is not even talked about uh really in any serious way you know maybe the idea of maybe having work permits so people could come and go because most people actually would prefer to come and go back home you know they don't necessarily want to stay forever they but they have no choice right once they get in they can't go out uh so there's just uh, anyway we could go on and on about that but yeah it would be it would be great uh for biden to see it but it's the political forces that have to you know pressure him as uh lbj was pressured to sign you know the civil rights act and you know and fdr famously had a quote something along those lines if you have a movement you know, bring it to me let me see it and then we can do something but you know it's just out of the blue i think biden would be afraid to uh show that he's not tough on immigration right yeah, I, I I would love to show Borderland at the White House. <laughs> we have to talk about this, Paca, uh, because I think that it's important to operate in whatever space you can open up. And um, but I would also ask that the protagonist of the film be there, so we could have um, a direct conversation between those who are most affected by the policies, those who are trying to organize undocumented workers and are being threatened with deportation. Um, because it's been very disappointing to see that both the Democratic and the Republican parties are united in their approach to immigration. I mean, they may have different methods and they may have different temporary policies, but the effects is actually the same, that there is violence at the border, that lots of people are dying trying to come to the United States, and lots of people who um, should be allowed to come are, are prevented from coming, and that there's no real rational immigration policy. So if Borderland can contribute to setting that straight, um, I definitely want to show it at the White House. I agree with Paco, though, that that unless we create, we, the, the films are really made not to um, just show it to the people making the policy. I really believe, too, we need to create grassroots movements. And, you know, films that are such emotional experiences, they can be a powerful tool to help do that. Because if you make a really good film, and people see it and they have an emotional experience. They want to do something with that emotion. And we want to give them something to be able to do with that emotion. Not tell them what to do, but make sure that they throw themselves into activism, which I know so many people uh, who are listening today uh, do and, and, and know so well. Thank you. Um, thank you for this. I, I'll go ahead and open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, I'll rely again, as usual, on Dennis to triage those. Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so I think we'll begin. Uh, I have my my question sheet here from people who have put their questions in the chat. Um, uh, Linda has a Linda J G has a question on um, the interest in making the film. So, Linda, you can you can I'm going to unmute you. You can ask your question yourself right now if you'd like. Oh, okay. I thought we were supposed to write them and somebody else read them. Okay. Um, I'm in Spain, by the way. Um, how did you become, my question is, how did you become interested specifically in Guatemala? Because at that time, there were similar things going on at other countries in Latin America and in Central America. Why Guatemala? I had been working as a sound recordist on other people's films in Nicaragua and El Salvador when I heard about this hidden war in Guatemala. It was really difficult to cover that war because it was happening mostly in the indigenous highlands. And, um, you know, uh, people weren't speaking Spanish in the indigenous highlands. You needed to find a way to get there and you needed to find a way to be able to talk to people. Um, it was that. And it was also that this was... Um, this was a war that the United States had helped foment, that this was a war that the United States had trained the Guatemalan military for and they had armed them. And so I felt as an American citizen that it was really important to reveal what, or to find out, because I didn't know, to find out and to reveal what was happening in Guatemala and to bring it back to the American public. 
And that was really, you know, the genesis for for the making of the film. And that film, When the Mountains Tremble, is very uh, hard hitting uh, about U.S., the United States and U.S. policy and the U.S. history with Guatemala. But ma mainly it was that, you know, there were there were there had been um, other things happening in military dictatorships throughout Latin America at that time. But the other reason was that I think that um, so much of what was happening was, and so many of the people who were being targeted and killed in Guatemala were indigenous. And so it was also not considered as an important, or they weren't considered as important as um, people who are being disappeared and killed in other countries. Thank you. Um, Dennis, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, yeah, just for clarity, um, when you put your questions in the chat, uh, you have the option, I'll call on you. You can ask the question yourself, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that, I can ask the, uh, the panel qu the, your question for you. So um, with that said, I'm gonna move on to um, Nicole Castle. Would you like to ask your question on, the, on um, when the mountains tremble? You can, I'm, I'm unmuting you now, you can do so if you'd like. Um, yes, I'll ask, thank you. Um... I was struck uh, watching the uh, the When the Mountains Tremble, the original film, uh, how you were able to get access uh, at such a dangerous time, uh, you know, on both sides, some of the places you were able to go to. And uh, I'm curious how and, and did you realize how dangerous it was at the time? I realized how dangerous it was. I knew that the people that were trying to tell the story were not were being killed and disappeared. The Guatemalans that were trying to tell the story, the really brave Guatemalan journalists and filmmakers. Um, but I also knew that as an American, <clears throat> I had a, a particular way to get in into the country and that um, the cost, the political cost of killing an American would be very high. Um, I, I, I knew going into Guatemala that um, under President Carter, U.S. military aid had been cut off to Guatemala for egregious human rights violations. And that the, I knew that the Guatemalan military wanted to reopen military aid to Guatemala. And they saw us, because there weren't a lot of crews working then at all. It wasn't, it's not like today. They saw us as a megaphone to, um, to, to convince the American policymakers and public that they were under threat from communism and that they should be given more uh, arms and that military sales should be reopened to Guatemala. So um, that was really how I was able to get access. I mean, when I first went to Guatemala, nobody would talk to me. It just took a, a long time to talk to people and um, get them to see that I really was interested in telling the story of what was happening in Guatemala across the political spectrum. Um, thank you. In between, there's people asking uh, a practical question. How do you access, what's the best way to access your films, the Skylight films? So we can... our, our, our website, which uh, I'll put it in, or if Dennis wants to put it in, I can, I can put it in the chat. It's uh, skylight.is. Here, I'll put it here. On our website, you can access our films. And uh, there you have it. Great in the chat um yeah thank you paco also for educational purposes it's new day films let me put that in there they have our films as well and another organization called canopy streaming which is like a netflix for educational and oh canopy with a k sorry uh, wonderful okay thanks paco we can do the there, next there, okay go ahead yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Go ahead, Dennis. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we actually had a few questions in the chat about why the trials um, take place, where why the, the trials take place where they do. Uh, Casa Linguna is online. You can ask your question if you want, which relates to that. Or sh should we just answer the question? I think we should good. I didn't quite uh, get the. I didn't quite get the I, question. I think the question, as I understood it, was how did the trial yeah. of Riosmont come about in Guatemala? But I was yeah. saying Granito. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. So well, or in Spain. Thinking about the different. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking. Is this my question? Yes. Why yeah. the trials are yeah. happening in different places? Okay. Um, I was just wondering why these always happen. Why are Why are they going through Spain? You know, okay. Spain has an an interesting and con conflicted history as well. Or Pinochet. Uh, I guess it started out uh, going through Spain, and then I feel like a lot of his trial sort of happened in the UK. Um, well, or... what happened? Yeah, I, what happened was that the Audiencia Nacional, which, you know, really isn't effective anymore. But at the time when with Pinochet, as you mentioned, that was a groundbreaking moment where a head of state uh, was, you know, arrested. Uh, and uh, that was for the Audiencia Nacional. So when Rigoberto Menchu uh, saw that, she went to Madrid with a bunch of boxes of evidence and testimonies and went to the Audiencia Nacional and asked that they open a trial uh, against Rios Montt and the generals in Guatemala. And that's where it all started. And that, you know, Granito uh, it shows that for a moment, you know, Rigoberta coming to, to the Audiencia Nacional. But the Audiencia Nacional, which was recognizing the the idea of universal jurisdiction that some crimes don't have borders uh, and you know that's how they operated and so that, that was revolutionary and so uh, Rigoberta picked right up on it and then as Pam had said earlier that the fact that the Rios Montt and, and the other generals were uh, basically indicted in, in the Audiencia Nacional even though they couldn't be extradited there because Guatemala wouldn't extradite them but that emboldened the Guatemalan judicial system to then open a trial in Guatemala. Yeah, and so, all of the evidence that was put forward in the Spanish National Court was then used by the Guatemalan prosecutors, yeah. um, as well as evidence that they gathered themselves. So it was really happy. There's this uh, judicial term that's come about called the Pinochet effect, right? Which is that if um, a court can try someone under the principle of universal jurisdiction, even if it's outside of their own country, that it does exactly what Paco said. It emboldens the, the country where the crimes were committed to try them. It embarrasses them too, you know? Like why and that, and that, speaking it? He, the judicial process actually never took place in, in, in England with Pinochet. He was visiting, remember he was visiting Margaret Thatcher there? And they had to, get, they had to try to get him extradited. To Spain, and they were never able to do that. But he was—he did go back to Chile, and in Chile, he faced charges of crimes against humanity and and corruption. Um, but he died before he went to trial. Yeah, but uh, another term. But his legacy has, was forever tarnished. Yeah, another term that has to do with this sort of trials in one place or attempting trials in one place, and then it happens in somewhere else. Is a justice cascade. It was like a justice cascade. Is you know. What flowed from Madrid and the Audiencia Nacional to Chile to Guatemala. Um, it's it's a powerful idea. I, th I think that to me the irony is always that that Spain, especially in between in the, between the late nineties and and say two thousand ten or so, was one of the hubs for this school of thinking about universal jurisdiction. And the Spanish criminal court, the Audiencia Nacional, became. Um, a place where many trials were held, like um, Israeli politicians were indicted, um, mm -hmm. Argentine, Chilean, um, Guatemalan, and um, all the while, all the while, Spain itself was incapable of facing its own cuenta uh, pendientes, uh, right? Its own own unfinished business from the Franco dictatorship, and when that finally came 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 to uh, through the same judge Carson came to a criminal investigation, the Supreme Court is very quick to shut that down. And since then, the Spanish victims have had to take recourse to an Argentine court under universal jurisdiction to find justice. So it kind of, it's an it's an ironic twist that Spain yeah. has been unable or unwilling to um, rescind its amnesty law to make possible judicial prosecution of people involved with the Franco dictatorship. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, we have that little part in Granito where we talk about the idea of universal jurisdiction and we show the statue of Garcia Lorca. So for those of you who know, and I know you know, those of you who know, know, and those who don't know, they aren't going to get that. But, you know, we make documentaries on many different levels and we're hoping that you'll get all the levels, but it's okay if you don't. 
<laughs> that's really great. Thank you guys. Let's, yeah. Dennis, let's go to the next question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, the next question is um, is going to be on um, the risks of documentary making. Um, Hannah Brolin Vallis, Valley, would you like to ask your question? I'm unmuting you now if you'd like to. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about, you know, you keep talking about high risks when they testify against the judge or um, you see that Freddie gets the note threatening his him and his family. Were there any retaliations that you know of? There have been a huge number of retaliations recently in Guatemala. Um, if you want to bring it up to the present, uh, there was in, in 500 years, if any of you have watched 500 years, which follows uh, Africa Granito, uh, there, you know, there's a, an organization called CICIG, the uh, Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, uh, which was very effective in uh, un unveiling corruption uh, in, in the government. And it ended up with the downfall uh, of uh, President Otto Perez Molina. But since then, there's been a real pushback by the rights, the fascists, I would say, in Guatemala, that has basically all of the judiciary that was involved in that trial are now in exile or in prison. And activists, human rights activists from Guatemala, uh, many, many of whom we know are in exile right now in Mexico and the United States and Spain. So uh, there has been that kind of retaliation. The criminalization is is the tool that's used now. You know, it used to be disappearances and torture, and you know, and, and people thrown out of helicopters. But now they, they do criminalization. So if you don't leave the country, you end up in prison without knowing when you're going to get out because you know, or when you're going to even have a trial. So that's um, unfortunately the situation right now in Guatemala. Yeah, and you know, to your point just even being threatened many times the threats are just threats right and and but you have to know when the threats are just threats and the threats or the threats are going to actually be carried out and, and that's the thing i think that weighs really heavily on people like freddie petrelli you know um how should he act when should he act he wants to never leave the country but he has to be very um circumspect about where he is and and when he's there so it's it's been very very difficult to to operate, very difficult. And and one of the protagonists of uh, our film Five Hundred Years is a Maya Ishi, you know, which is the same community that suffered most under the genocide. But he was uh, uh, not born during the you know he was born after the genocide. But he's an activist defending his community against uh, mining industries. And uh, he was threatened, and it was a real threat. Uh, one of his close colleagues was killed. So he left uh, to seek asylum in the United States. And that's uh, one of the stories that we have in Borderlands. So, you know, like as Pam just said, some threats are very real, and you know that you have to take it seriously. It's interesting, if I can intervene with another quick question, that um, in many ways, the stories that the story that you tell in in, uh, in in several of your films sort of champion the courts as um, and, and brave lawyers and, and brave judges and brave juries as tools to gain justice. At the same time, the story you tell now reminds reminds us that um, the one thing that fascists are good at is taking control of you of the judiciary precisely, right? To um, thinking of the US Supreme Court um, yeah. and, and, and the way in which right-wing regimes have um, used what we call lawfare to basically um, disactivate or, or, or exile or, or, or silence the opposition. Um, what's, can, the, can we put our hopes still in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the courts in that way? Or is it just too complicated, too compromised of, a, of, a, of an undemocratic system? I mean, I think, frankly, I think we can never rest. It's never, there's never going to be a time when you know, forces, of, you know, that want to have power by force. I don't know. I, I just don't see it. I, you know, we have wins and then we have setbacks, and 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 that's just how. And and for me, a great and inspiring example, frankly, is the Mayan people that we learned so much because you know, for 500 years, they they have been 
you know, making gains, having setbacks, uh, they've maintained their culture, their languages. Um, so, you know, and they themselves say, they just have to pass it on from generation to generation. It's, it's a never ending story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dennis, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. I think you may have covered, I, I also I implore everybody to put, if they have a question, put it in the chat. So we'll be doing this for a little bit longer. So if you do uh, have a question, put it in the chat. Uh, I don't know if this has been answered already, but I know um, Sherry, I'm not sure her last name, is requesting me to ask a question. Um, and I think we've touched on this, but maybe we can return to it. Can you describe more about this court in Spain and their jurisdiction? So, you know, we talked about like the reasoning why, but is there any like um, legal, legalistic and procedural reasons to do these things with uh, within this court or in The Hague and stuff like that? Well, I, I can I can spin give a quick spin on that question. I, I think it'd be interesting to think to to hear from you how you see development in international law, and whether you think that that period between the late '90s and the early 2000s, in which many things were happening, was an exceptional period, and things have retreated from that, or whether the justice cascade that was put in motion then continues, despite efforts by uh, governments and 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 power holders to limit what the International Criminal Court in The Hague, what international tribunals can do and, and what universal jurisdiction can do. Do you have a, a sense of where things are at and, and where things are going? I, I think it's funny that yeah, we think about that, like the ICC, the International Criminal Court, we made a, um, a film about the creation of the International Criminal Court called The Reckoning. And at the time that we made the reckoning, which was uh, from 2006 to 2009, more or less, uh, the U.S. was very much, you know, against it. Uh, the Bush administration, you know, didn't want any part of it. Uh, and now we see that, you know, the, the U.S. is calling for the ICC to prosecute Putin. Which, but you know, when when uh, the ICC prosecutor wanted to build a case against the United States for war crimes committed in Afghanistan, they revoked the visa of the ICC prosecutors and she couldn't come to the United States. And so this, this back and forth, it's like, so are, are these, these are new instruments of international justice. And I think they're, it's kind of like finding their footing. And I've heard that the Supreme Court, when it was created here in the US, uh, in the South, nobody took it seriously. And you know, it was uh, sort of, so what? And uh, you know, so it, as we've watched the Supreme Court go through different iterations, right? With, where it's either more progressive or more right wing, and now it's like completely corrupt. Uh, so I don't know these, but I think it's important that the International Criminal Court exists. I've always felt that you know, once it, it was finally made, the treaties were signed and it exists, and then we hope that you know, over time, the court will find its footing. So we'll see. So, so Borderland is coming out in uh, in 2024, hopefully. What's right. next? Do you have plans for your project after that? Yes. Yeah. You mean for another film? Another film, the next film, the film after this. Well, okay. First, let me just say that um, for all of our films, we have a, a multi-year outreach and impact campaign. So for every film that we make, every feature length documentary we make, like Granito, we create a media ecosystem so that we can um, create short films, nano documentaries, educational guides, interactive digital projects. You know, we want really people who are moved when they see the film to be able to have a place to go, to dig deeper oh, and, and, and to get involved. Okay. Um, and 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 so um, with Borderland, we're going to be working on that for for several years. But actually, the next film that we're going to do after Borderland is a film about the Caribbean Music Festival and the Caribbean Music Festival that took place in Cartagena in the 1980s and early 1990s is something that Paco was a founder of. And it's a place where Paco and I met um, and began our um, love and creative journey together. So maybe Paco, you want to talk about that film? <laughs> yeah. So when I was living in Cartagena, um, I 
had the idea of you know making a Caribbean music festival, which brought together all the Caribbean culture. Because as an outsider in Cartagena, I saw that there's this really amazing cultural activity going on, but it wasn't recognized in Colombia. I mean, th there was no sense of identity as as Caribbean. It was more in an Andean nation, and you know from Bogota. And so um, I I thought this should be celebrated and it's a long story. I won't tell it all here, but we ended up making a festival which went on for 12 years, uh, you know, four, four days where music people and, and culture from all over the Caribbean coming together in Cartagena for four days every year. And it was a transformative event. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen this film, Summer of Soul, which uh, won the Oscar last year, but not this year, I, I recommend it. But it's about how music can be a transformative uh, element in a society. Right, and Sorry. yeah, and and the Caribbean Music Festival, um, you know how it how as you said how it brought together all all, all these different musical uh, influences um, that came from Africa and North America and swirled throughout the Caribbean and the northern coast of Latin America, and and because Paco had made sure to document every single festival we have this incredible archive okay <laughs> here we here we circle back around to the importance of archive so we thought especially during the pandemic we're gonna harness the power of the archive and catalog the archive and make something from um, this archive so that this festival and this coming this very specific time in history um, and coming together these very specific ideas that then uh, grew and were nurtured and went on um, would be an important film to make. Also something a little bit different than what we've been doing. It sounds yeah. like a super interesting film. I'd love to see that. And such an interesting change of, of scenery a little bit for you guys, a change of mood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And an another thing that's an ongoing project, which is now going into its fourth year, is uh, that came out of the Solidar Labs. It's called Vivex. Vivex is a network of defenders by defenders uh and we did a lot of development of it together in these big zoom meetings during the pandemic and uh developed an app the vivex app uh which is used by this network of environmental and human rights defenders it, and it came about because of you know this sort of frustration and dismay at all the assassinations of defenders that happened uh, any of you that follow this, I mean, the, the, the annual reports of the assassinations in Colombia and Mexico and Guatemala are huge. And so uh, the idea of the defenders was, let's have our own network, our own voice, uh, and, and so that the narratives, and so the role of the filmmakers and storytellers in this is to help shift those narratives from the toxic narratives about defenders as being enemies of progress and, you know, uh, enemies of the people to uh, the, being the front line of defense of our planet and, you know, to really see them as uh, an, an important, crucial element in the battle to save our planet from climate change and from extractivism. And so uh, that, that project is an ongoing project. And uh, there's an Instagram, uh, an Instagram feed that just launched because it's a private network. It, it's not like an open uh, social media network, even though there's an app, but it, you can you can uh, see the app in either the Apple Store or Android, but you can follow on Instagram. It's just starting uh, this week. It's gonna be sort of the voice of Vivex coming out. Um, and it's called Red Vivex, R-E-D-V-I-V-X on Instagram. V-I-V-X. And, yeah, and YouTube. Right. So, yeah, so these are like collaborative stories between defenders and uh, social justice filmmakers from Colombia, from Mexico, from Guatemala, and, and now next coming up to Peru. And it has a cinema element, too, because we use all the the network of all the people that participated in Solidar Labs, many of whom are filmmakers, to do the cinematic portraits of each of the defenders. So we're trying to think about ways to um, use cinema and different forms of cinema uh, in the programs of Skylight. You guys, I can't believe you have, have had time to spend an hour with us, but you do so much, you must be so busy. Um, I wanna, wanna 
close up and, and thank you too for 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 your time and for sharing your movie with us and for all the work that you do um and for your support of of what we try to do in alba um and and i wanted to uh tell everybody present that um among our next events is on may 17th i think at 3 p.m if i'm not mistaken at 3 p.m we'll have another online event which will be a visit to the ALBA collection at the Tamman Library um, in New York, a, a peek behind the reference desk. We go into the archive with uh, Shannon O'Neill, the, 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 the director of Tamman Library, to take a look at the more than 300 um, um, collections that we have as part of the ALBA collection at the Tamman Library. So that's on May 17th at 3 p.m. Keep an eye on your, on your email inbox for details and a link to register for that. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, you'll probably get an email um, asking for your feedback about this event. We're always very interested in, in ideas and, and to know what you thought of it. Thanks again, Paco and Pam, and for all the work you do with Skylight. And thank you. Uh, it's lovely to see you all and uh, stay well and keep up the good work. And thanks as always for your generous support. We really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Sebastian. Bye. Thanks, Dennis, Peter. Ciao.